morning, good afternoon, good evening to people around the world. This is your host, Martin Kubel of the DB2 Night Show, the ZOS edition today. And uh, we're very fortunate once again to have Mariella Wyrock of the uh, uh, IBM SVL lab here to talk on the best practices for developing high performing DB2, or sorry, Java applications for DB2. How are you today, Mariella? Fine, thank you. Great. Great. So let me get the housekeeping out of the way so we can get on to the good stuff. Uh, as always, here's our uh, Get Involved and where replays are now available on YouTube in addition to downloads off our site, our, our LinkedIn group. And we have the, uh, I always put out uh, little reminders on, uh, on Twitter about when uh, replays are available and when the next show is coming up. There's our disclaimer with all of the things about copyrights and things being recorded and all that type of stuff. And, uh, and here's our standard run through. The, the upcoming shows, the next show will be yours truly. I'll be talking on something that was near and dear to my heart when I went into a startup company and uh, as the first DBA helping them to get going. And uh, that show is called The Data Pioneer and what you do when there's nothing there. Uh, the show after that is our season finale, which is Dave Belke talking on DB2 security best practices and staying up with the threats. And then, of course, we are into our summer replay period. And, of course, with the stay home summer, why not watch some more DB2 Night Show? They're all out there and they're all great. Also, as always, our primary sponsor and founding sponsor of the uh, DB2 Night Show is DBI Software. Uh, there's a demo there you can watch. If you do, they'll send you a gift card, and that's uh, talking about DB2 LUW performance. It's uh, worth your time. Our winner from last time was Jason McKernan of Shelter Insurance. He has won an Amazon gift certificate just for watching the show. You can win a, a certificate. And as always, our sponsors are DBI and yours truly, Martin Hubel Consulting, Inc. This is a uh, service level uh, SL, uh, service level agreement attainment a screen from the DBI products. Rather than doing a full commercial these days, we, I just like to show you some of their new screens for their, their new version that's coming out. This is talking of how close you are to meeting your SLAs and, and how well you've done. And that's a very useful screen to take to management to know that you're doing the right things. All right, now we're into our famous polling section here. Let me uh, bring these up and we'll ask the, the uh, polls as always. First one is uh, what version of uh, DB2 on Z are you running? And, uh, I'm happier these days to see that everyone seems to be on at least uh, version 11 new function mode. All of that older stuff is not not being run by our audience. I know there's still some stuff out there. Did a review for a company five years ago or so, and they were still running DB2 version seven because they didn't want to pay for a 64-bit machine. They were only running a steel mill, nothing too important. All right, with that, uh, we'll close that off and share the results there. We're finding that 50% of our audience is on version 12, function level 500 or higher, which is great news. Next one, what DBMSs do you have lying around in your shop? Let me launch that. You can select more than one here. Some of those old mainframe DBMSs just don't die. It was rather funny. I, when I first started with DB2, there was a big discussion on which, which DBMSs people had, and there was such a discussion on things like Supra, Total, IDMS, Datacom DB. Those things are still out there running certain applications. And there's our audience today. Everybody's 100% DB2, as one would expect. <coughs> I'm 
use Java used to develop business critical applications. Getting some answers here. It's been a lot of uh, online activity with various shows running, and there was the uh, IBM Think Conference last week, and we have uh, next week IBM is running their uh, user community uh, uh, workshops on Tuesday and Wednesday. If you have, haven't heard about them, you can Google that and get involved if you're interested. They've got some big speakers lined up for that. And what we find here is that uh, Java is being used by two-thirds of our audience to run uh, business critical applications. I think we have, oh, well, we've got two more, two more uh, quick polls here. Where are the Java applications running? Not too surprised by these answers, but um, that seems that we have uh, enough of our audience to have voted, so I'll close that and share that result there. It's on, on premises. Um, Distributed and uh, ZOS and uh, Z Linux, interesting. And the final one we will, which uh, drivers being used? And here we have uh, type two, type four, type four distributed. And it's nice to see that. People that are connecting aren't using the old type two anymore. They're only using the type four. That's nice to see. That yeah, depends. <laughs> it depends. Well, you'll tell us about that, won't you? All righty. So we'll hide that. And at this point, I think we are ready to move on to your presentation. Should be seeing. Seeing yourself there, I will now make you the presenter, and we can, uh, as we practiced before, you'll be able to uh, uh, click on that. And I am seeing your presentation. I, the best pre and uh, the, the uh, PowerPoint uh, slides that you would want to show. Yes, and now I need to get my mouse <laughs> to the right place. Yes. yes. All right, so I'm going to mute myself for now. I will burst in if there's some question that needs to be taken, and I'll be here if you need any help. But uh, just to cut down on any noise, our dog no longer barks because he can't hear anything. But uh, it still makes it a little quieter around to have, have me muted. So please take her away. Thank you. And as Martin already mentioned, I want to share uh, best practices for developing high-performance Java applications that access data to uh, that is stored in DB2 for COS. Um, you see is acknowledgement and disclaimer, which you can read as a homework. And with this, we go into our agenda. So first, let me ensure that Java application accessing enterprise data in DB2 have been implemented successfully in a lot of companies. And the best practices and recommendations that I'll share in this presentation are actually findings from those projects uh, coming from around the world. Uh, some of those recommendations talk as DB2 systems programmers. Some will be implemented by database administrators, and I will also discuss Java coding best practices that benefit from the optimization in the data server driver for JDBC and SQLJ, as well as in DB2. So first, I'd like you uh, to give you an overview of the data server driver for JDBC and SQLJ architecture. I think understanding the driver architecture, you can easier differentiate expected behavior from unexpected. 
and tackle problems this way. Hmm? So the main three areas for creating and well-performing um, applications are the connection management, the so, uh, optimization of dynamic SQL execution using the statement cache in the driver and the DB2 dynamic statement cache. And last but not least, the best practices for coding SQL uh, in the Java application. I think uh, every time I have to remember people that Java is an object-oriented programming language and creating as well as a garbage collection of complex objects like a DB2 connection object or an, a statement object can be resource and elapsed time consuming if done frequently. So what do you actually do in a database interaction? So let me first go into the panoramic view. When we look at the DB2 drivers in that view, uh, pretty much all popular programming languages can be mapped back to either the DB2 driver for CLI and ODBC, which I will shortly call the driver for C-based applications, or the DB2 driver for JDBC and SQLJ, which I shortly will call the Java-based driver. Both drivers are part of the DB2 Connect product uh, that require when accessing DB2 for COS uh, DB2 Connect license, even you are not installing the DB2 Connect server. So let's go into the details. At the bottom of the chart is a database system, in our case, DB2 for COS. Both drivers support all IBM data servers, um, so DB2 on AUW as well, as well as Informix. The drivers manage the connection to the database using DRDA protocol over TCP IP, um, including fairly advanced security and authentication support. And both the C based and Java based driver implement an internal SQL API that all language APIs are mapped to. So if we narrow on the Java-based driver on the right side of the chart, uh, as you can see, it supports most common Java APIs. So JDBC as defined in the J2EE standard, SQLJ as defined in the SQL standard, and persistence implementations like Pure Query, Hibernate, and Spring, but also the more modern languages like Scala, Ruby on Rail, Python, and um, are supported in this Java based client. Um, Spark application can also seamlessly read data from IBM Data Server into Spark. Uh, creating data frames and write from the data frames to IBM data server using the data server driver. So I think that's important for all uh, analytical style application. The C based driver support on the left side uh, supports languages such as .NET, PHP, and JavaScript. Um, but I'm not covering this further in my presentation here. Uh, interesting fact, um, in companies, I see a standardization either on .NET or Java for the next generation application. It's very seldom that they are actually both, um, but they are very equivalent in functionality. So this uh, what I want to point out is that uh, the separation between the APIs and the connection management actually allows to support new programming languages quick, quickly. As you see, uh, the programming language landscape uh, changed significantly over the year and then is expected um, to change going forward. So with this approach, we can support uh, those languages uh, quickly 
and still benefit from the functionality of the mature typhosome, which of course is important in an enterprise usage. So let's look at the architecture in one level further down. Um, so you see at the top the common layer for the supported APIs. Uh, that layer allows for truly portable application across platforms and database servers. It's implemented 100% in Java. And if you use the SQL that is supported in the common SQL reference, uh, the Java applications would be 100% portable between, uh, for example, DB2 AUW and DB2 COS. Um, the common API layer sits on top of the communication layer, and that is specific to the connectivity type uh, and the database you, you connect to. So if the Java applications run on the same machine as the DB2 AUW database, you would preferably use the type two local support to DB2 AUW, which uses the SQL uh, API interface. Uh, admittedly, this is a very rare configuration. Uh, if the Java application runs locally on COS, and connects to DB2 COS in the same LPO, you would preferably use the type two local support, um, which can, uses OS attached to connect. In the uh, questionnaire, we saw that no one uses the type two driver, uh, all use the type four driver, even when they come from um, COS environment. And that may be a discussion point later on in my exercise that I include a, included there may be some of the performance misconception but we get to that so the for java in the last part for java applications running on a different uh, system or lpo as a, the database you would connect to the database via type 4 driver and that uses drda over tcp ip to connect to the backend database so um, we actually received many questions in the past about our recommendation using type two versus type four. Uh, and Martin, you mentioned, uh, you know, moving off the old type two driver, which I don't agree fully. That's fine. <laughs> obviously. Yeah, that's fine. That's great. Uh, because actually the type two driver had major performance enhancements in and the last DB2 versions. Uh, the move to the type 4 driver is generally uh, with a goal to maximize SIP utilization. Uh, in reality, uh, the goal should be to minimize channel CP utilization and typically with a goal to minimize the monthly license charge. Uh, even we have also charging models now. Um, so many uh, keep in mind, many performance optimization went into both the type two and the type four driver, actually the JDK, uh, exploiting all the latency hardware enhancements, communication server, as well as DB2. So I think actually the JDK on COS is the best performing JDK you can get anywhere. Mm. Uh, because it's exploiting so many hardware instruction and, and is therefore very efficient, uh, which to my knowledge, no other JDK is doing. Uh, so except if the Java application calls native SQL store procedure, I still think that, or I'm convinced that the type two driver is actually uh, providing better performance and lower general CP utilization. But of course, if you are not sure, it's easy to test uh, by changing the data source property between both. We, you can test the application and compare the performance results. I just want to remember you, you look for minimizing general CP utilization and not maximizing SIP utilization as a decision criteria. 
So let's now go into uh, the first main area uh, for well-performing Java application, and that is the connection management. Um, so the JDBC standard defines two ways to connect to the database. First, the JDBC one standard that uses Cypher Manager uh, objects with Cypher Manager get connection method uh, to determine Cypher type connectivity information. Um, those applications are not really portable. Uh, so we actually recommend to use JDBC2 standards, the data source API um, that delivers increased application portability because you can use a logical name uh, that maps actually to your data source objects in the JNDI service, naming service. And it also maps to uh, you know, your database name, IP port user and password. So it's, uh, you just change the assignment, but you don't need to change uh, your application with the connectivity uh, on the logical level. So application servers can be used to configure and manage those data sources and the properties. Um, and then you can easily change it, uh, those data source definition as you move the Java application from one, uh, from one server to another. Um, from a driver perspective, and that is the latest uh, that actually evolved, um, a connection obtained through the data source object is actually identical to a connection obtained through the driver manager facility. Um, but as I mentioned, data source has more flexibility uh, in specifying connection properties. So, and talking about driver and connection properties, they are actually a very important way to influ influence driver behavior. So those driver properties need to be defined as Java systems properties or in the property file. So both are uh, kinds are um, required. So the global property files need to be defined as system properties. And then we have um, data source properties that are defined um, when you define your data source or when you define your application. Um, the JDBC standard defines a set of properties to describe a data source implementation. Uh, IBM added many more to customize the driver behavior. And you see a couple of examples at the bottom of the page. So I want to point out a couple of very popular or very common ones. For example, security mechanism is defined, is used to define authentication and encryption options and should always be set. Uh, the default is not encrypted, user ID and password. I don't think this is acceptable anywhere. Um, another very common property is current schema. So that's the DBT current schema special register. Uh, the property enables sysplex workload balancing, enables sysplex workload balancing and client rerouting, and should always be set if connecting to a DB2 data sharing group to uh, get the continuous availability behavior across planned and unplanned outages of data sharing members. So, uh, there are also properties such as defer, prepare, or cursor sensitivity that may only be set in rare occasions. Uh, the default works best in most cases. So I would like to ask you to look into the driver documentation for the complete list of all properties. Uh, it's, it's actually a pretty long list. Um, uh, I just want to point out um, two topics. One is uh, the connection properties can be specified in multiple ways as listed on the slide. Um, and I also want to point out if you use WebSphere application server, um, the connection centric properties uh, need to be defined in the data source 
for example, enable cisplex workload balancing or um, security mechanism. Uh, so application-centric properties such as setting a special register like cone schema can be defined with the application. And the result is that you can reduce the number of data sources. So you basically share application um, using the same data source and therefore improving the effectiveness of the connection pool um, for this specific data source. Uh, since DB211, uh, special registers can also be set via the profile table in DB2. And in DB212, um, the support of the DB2 defined global variables were added. Think about uh, transparent archiving global variables. So. so now let's look into managing the connection object. Uh, because this is the first step to providing well-performing uh, Java applications. Uh, you, you need to keep in mind all database resources hang on a connection object. We are on an object-oriented language. Huh? So first, a connection object itself is a fairly complex object. And in order to create that connection object, the driver actually has to obtain a physical database connection, which in turn requires multiple network strips, um, uh, as defined in, in the DRDA standard. So on the first network request, the client and server exchange function levels and client credentials. And then on the second network trip, uh, the mode of operations like code pages, package size, uh, are established. So creating and terminating a connection object is somewhat resource and time consuming, both in the driver as well as in DB2. And additionally, all the cache statement objects are actually chained of the connection object under which they were executed. So if a connection is closed, the statement objects underneath will be closed and garbage collected as well. And of course, if the statement is executed, again, needs to be recreated. So using a connection object pool allows to reuse the connection across multiple executions of an SQL and significantly influences the performance behavior. So if uh, now we start going into the set of recommendations. The first one, if you take one recommendation away from this entire presentation, then it's use the client info properties in your Java applications. All properties can be set in the Java application or implicitly via the web sphere trace. My recommendation is to set those values in the typically Java framework uh, method that gets the connection and hands it out to the application. The client info properties or application name. So, so you can set a name of the application. Um, you can uh, set client accounting information as well as the client host name and the client user. The client info fields are actually a powerful way to manage and monitor Java application in DB2. So um, I try to illustrate it on an example. Let's assume you have implemented two functions in a Java application. One drives a business critical function and another does some um, data archiving. So both function connect to DB2 via a functional user ID. Um, and by default would run with the same priority in DB2. DB2 cannot differentiate those. Uh, and a DBA or DB2 systems program has little insight what is running in DB2. It's, it's all coming from the same server using the same user ID to connect to, so it's, it looks the same. But in reality, you would like to run the business critical function with a higher priority. 
and you would like to know which thread in DB2 runs the data archiving uh, in case you have to make a decision what thread to cancel in case of a problem. Uh, and the client info fields gives you exactly that level of granularity. So you can use the client info fields in WM to set different workload goals in resource limit facility. In the profile tables, they show up in display thread detail in the SMF records for monitoring and problem determination. Um, so please have a look and plan to use them if you not already do so. Hmm? The next important recommendation is if you connect to data sharing group, which the majority of the DB2C installations are, use this flex workload balancing. It is functionality that exists since almost day one of the data server driver, so more than 15 years now. Uh, the high level concept uh, actually shines through its simplicity the driver introduces a transport object that holds the physical connection to the database, separating the physical connection from the connection object. So let's go through the picture step by step. So on the left side, you see the connection object three sitting in the connection pool. A connection object in the connection pool is not related to transport object in this case. So the line between the logical connection and the transport object is always separated at commit or rollback uh, before the connection goes back into the pool. So if it cannot be separated, the connection object will not go back into the pool. Connection object one and two are handed to an application. When the application sends the first SQL, via this connection, the driver selects a transport based on the workload information that it gets from DB2 for COS and uh, selects the most suitable DB2 member to execute that SQL. So on the right side of this picture is a data sharing group with two members. The transport object actually holds the physical connection to one or the other data sharing member. So this way you can ensure that um, the application always uses a valid connection to the backend database and a stale connection exception which are actually the number one reason why web application servers are uh, recycled and causing outages uh, can be avoided almost 100%, um, except um, you know, there is an outage in the middle of a transaction, of course, and you have to uh, roll back and, and uh, sort, uh, sort the transaction. Uh, over again, retries the transaction. Okay, so uh, there is still, and, and we just had a very recent conversation on it. Um, by default, there is actually a test connection property on an application server connection pool, uh, and you typically define an SQL statement. That is a very expensive way uh, to ensure that the connection is not stale before it's used to the application because it actually triggers a full SQL execution uh, back to the database, even if it's this uh, select from this IBM system, it's, it's still going through the network, it's still going to DB2 and return. So it's, uh, in some J2E applications where you use very simple SQL statement, it almost can double the CPU consumption because the cost of testing the application is actually as expensive as uh, the cost of executing the SQL that comes from the application. So um, the next point I want to discuss is going now back to the DB2 side. When the driver connects to a member of the data sharing group, 
um, the member returns a member list with all available members in the group and its relative weight. This is how the driver selects the most suitable um, DB2 member to execute. Um, you may have the need to subset the group for specific members. Uh, so, for example, you have dedicated DB2 members for KICS workloads and for distributed workloads or by workload characteristics such as OLTP and ad hoc queries and reporting workloads, um, which may trigger that you have different DB2C forms configured uh, for those workloads. So changing the location alias requires to stop DDF and very likely causes an outage for also distributed application accessing that member. So it's very disruptive. Um, the DB2 location alias functionality is actually addressing this problem. So you can define more aliases per data sharing group and stop and start the aliases via command without impacting um, the author location aliases or even stop and start DDF. So the recommendation is to create a location alias for groups of application with similar characteristics. So for example, Reporting application uses a different location alias than core business application. Um, you, we would recommend you to define the location alias on all members, but only start them on the members where you want the application to execute them. So in the above example, location alias one is started on all four members. Um, Whereas location alias two is started on member DP1P and DP3P, and location alias three is started on member DP22P and DP4P. So let's assume that after application three deployed a new version, unexpected behavior is observed. And you very easily, you just need to location alias three to stop on, for example, member DB2, DB2P to isolate the application until the problem is addressed and therefore not impacting uh, other distributed application or in general other application on that member. So I need to watch my time actually. Um, so Martin, um, I have, um, and also 30 minutes or 15 minutes? It's up to you. We'll take whatever you want to give us because we're those okay. <laughs> sponges for the information you have. Yeah, so uh, I need to be go a little faster, I think, uh, okay. because I want to get to the exercise at the end. Great. So the DB2 high performance DBED uh, is an important uh, performance optimization it actually starts the owner packages bound with release deallocate de when port from distributed application. And we know release deallocate, it avoids repeated package allocation and deallocation at commit. And it also optimizes uh, um, sign on behavior or the auth uh, authentication behavior. Uh, in distributed application and also optimizes actually the uh, thread going active or the connection going active and inactive. Um, so we recommend to rebind the client packages into a different collection ID, bind this with release, deallocate, and um, as well as rebind also frequently and the focuses on frequently used packages um, with uh, rebind, the allocate. It could be SQLPL packages or trigger packages. And then set the option, package rel, bind option, and DDF would rec recognize the uh, release, the allocate setting and behave differently. And in order to make it work, uh, you of course have to redefine the data source to point the, um, to the new collection via the property JDBC collection. 
And we go uh, come to that uh, in, in one more, in the exercise, actually. Mm -hmm. So the next one, um, the DB2 connection profile is actually a very efficient tool uh, for DBAs to influence um, uh, application behavior. Uh, and it addresses the problems that uh, historically those values, data source properties would need to be set from the web application server administrator who had little incentive and knowledge about those ch changes. So now this connection profile table gives the DBA the authority to influence how the distributed application behave. Um, so you can define the application profile in the table, this is IBM DSN underscore profile underscore table. And you can define different criteria in as application scope filter. Client info fields could be a filter, IP address could be a filter, role if you use trusted context uh, and so on. And then you can define number of threads and connections either set timeout values um, or, or uh, special registers and in version 12, um, the DB2 provided global variables. Uh, one typical example is uh, if an application typically uses 20 concurrent connections, you may set the value of concurrent connection, number of connections to 40 to allow for workload spikes. Uh, but prevent a bigger impact if, for example, an exception in the application starts creating new connection in a tight loop, which actually happens in different um, environments at least once a, a year. Um, it's a connection failure uh, exception seems to be the very worst tested one um, and has significant impact. Um, Okay, so now this is the topic on the connection management. Now let's go to prepared statements. Uh, JDBC defines statement objects and prepared statement objects. So similar to connection objects, prepared statement uh, and statement objects are somewhat complex objects because they contain the describe information for the SQL, so the definition for input and output. And even that needs to have two database calls, a describe um, in order, and an execute in order to fully populate. Um, the property to fill prepare is actually uh, intended to chain those DB2, two DB2 requests in a single network trip, so it's only going over the network once. So, um, so generally, we recommend to use prepared statement objects as they are pooled in the prepared statement object pool, and therefore the object can be uh, repeatedly executed without creating and garbage collection of the object. Um, a statement object cannot be cached. Um, so, so the first recommendation would actually be use a prepared statement object versus uh, a statement object. It's a very common problem. Um, and then, of course, on the DB2 side, you want to have the um, dynamic statement cache on so that um, DB2 does not need to go through um, a full prepare um, in order to execute it. In general, this is not a concern for SQLJ because SQLJ pulls all statements, um, all objects that are um, uh, th that are re representing an SQLJ uh, statement. Hmm? So no concern for SQLJ in this respect. Hmm? So this gives you a coding example, how it, a statement object looks versus a, a prepared statement object. Uh, and the most significant one is that you use the setter and getter function in order to set um, the host variables and get the results. So, 
Dynamic statement cache in DB2, I think, is well established now. Uh, in interest of time, uh, this is summarizes how to enable it. Uh, just consider a full prepare can consume anywhere between 10 and 100 times the CPU than uh, a short prepare and can be a multiple of actually executing the SQL. So there should be no dynamic SQL execution without uh, the DB2 dynamic statement cache uh, turned on. Hmm? And uh, it should be repeatedly monitored uh, if the hit ratio goes below 90%, then it's definitely time for action to, to look into the reason and act on it. And one action could be actually to use little replacement uh, for global dynamic statement cache. Um, so you would turn it on via the property enable literal replacement set to yes. Or if you're already in DB212 new function mode, then there is a bind option concentrate statement. And again, recommendation would be to bind similar to release the allocate. You want to bind the client property, uh, client packages into a different collection and then um, that uh, binds the packages with concentrate statement in order to enable the functionality. Hmm? Um, just re remember that um, using literal replacement is still more expensive than uh, using parameter markers uh, for DB2 lookup uh, because with literal replacement, DB2 goes to the cache actually twice. So, wants to check if it has a match with the literals and then um, executing the, uh, the statement with a little replacement. So uh, very short on SQLJ. It's, I'm, I'm not spending a lot of time there. I only want to assure you that quite a number of large companies adopted SQLJ as standard and using it. Um, and it's it's still support it is supported um, so there's no question about that and it it has benefits uh, from a monitoring performance perspective uh, you don't need to watch the caches as much as with JDBC uh, the downside is SQLJ never became a part of the J2E um, uh, standard and therefore the adoption from the application developer community is not as high as some of the database folks would want to wish. So uh, here an example for some optimization um, or best practice coding best practices. Um, both the JDBC standard as well as SQLJ allow for batching. Uh, so batch update and a batch insert. The driver has an extension where you can actually batch selects as well, which is uh, interesting in some use cases. And it, it works very similar to calling a stored procedure with, which results multiple result sets. So you just step through the result sets one at a time and get the results out of it. Um, so this can significantly reduce network activity in certain application scenarios. So let me go through some also um, uh, um, problem areas. Some of them are a surprise. Uh, some are um, created by the default. So the first one is auto commit on um, by JDBC standard, this is the default, and we strongly recommend to not use it. Uh, so setting it off. Uh, consider there is, um, or check for a mismatch of Java and DB2 data types. Uh, it still works, the application still works, but there is data type uh, transformation going on under the cover pretty much for every value you move between the application and DB2, so fairly high multiplier. So that can actually add up. Same on the same line, um, 
use number data types for numbers because string, which is a very uh, common data type in Java, has a code page assigned to it. So you are actually going through code page translation um, if, if it's translated into numbers and that would not be necessary. Um, avoid the retrieval of unused columns. So select store should be a no-no. It's, it, it's a very old recommendation in DB2 and it's even more true in the Java world because uh, in many cases those retrieved columns become objects. So Java is busy creating object and garbage collection objects that are not actually used in the application. Uh, look at the transaction isolation. Uh, repeatable read is a default in WebSphere, um, which is far more restrictive than cursor stability, which the majority of the DB2 application use, or even uncommitted read. And uh, the, the next one is actually a pattern that comes for Java applications that move from Oracle to uh, DB2. Oracle doesn't have a true positioned update, so the select for update actually is used for communicating locking semantics. And the equivalent in DB2 would be with OS use and keep update logs. Um, for update uh, in DB2 tells um, to use a position update and it limits actually um, the access path as well as the network communication can be much more expensive as well. Hmm? From a JDBC perspective, um, of course, uh, close the objects when they are not used, so they can actually go back in the cache or uh, can be garbage collected. That's best practice for Java behavior. Uh, we already mentioned um, the usage of prepared statement and parameter markers. Um, it's a very common pattern that in Java you just concatenate a literal with a variable with a literal, but in, in from an SQL or from a DB2 perspective, this becomes actually, uh, the Java variables become literal, so you would at least need to use the literal replacement object in this case. Um, cursor defined as hold is the JDBC default and there are a lot of optimization in DB2 that DB2 closes, hold cursors that are exhausted, but the easiest way is to actually not hold the cursor if the application is not expecting to reuse it. Um, and then a few locking and concurrency recommendation. Um, so you can use lock size rules selectively uh, for uh, tables that report deadlocks and timeouts, which you can find out via the DB2 performance trace, uh, class six. And you should look into using member cluster if in a data sharing environment to reduce the page P log and page latch contention. Um, so that, that is a locking recommendation. And the other one, uh, which is actually generally true that you should review your index usage. Uh, on one side, missing indexes can cause the wrong access path or inefficient access path. And on the other side, you really want to drop unused indexes because every insert update delete has potentially has to maintain those indexes. And uh, just a reminder that S SKI punch uh, I is the skip uncommitted insert for isolation CS and uh, RS. Uh, it's actually uh, C forms that can help this lock contention to, to go over the inserts that are not committed yet, which is uh, a common J2E pattern for the application. So with that, I actually want to go into a practice and, and that is, uh, based on a fairly recent real customer example. Um, so in this example, the Java application use, runs on CUS and uses a type two connectivity. 
um, I was in a, in a, a meeting with this team and they communicated in the conversation that they would like to reduce the CPU consumption of this Java application. And we are asking if switching to type four would actually accomplish that. Uh, of course, with the goal to uh, uh, increase the SIP offload. Uh, just a disclaimer in the context, uh, they did not use uh, or the DB2 systems was not set up for distributed workload. So changing from type two to type four was not just changing a data source configuration, but uh, it was would have involved uh, testing and rollout in production with uh, contribution from multiple teams. So the question to you is, um, looking at this accounting report, which I asked for in order to make a sound recommendation, would you recommend to start this project and go to convert to a type four driver? And, um, you know, based on the earlier questionnaire, a lot blindly went to type four driver, I assume. So I give you a minute to think about it. I could have a pull now, yes or no, Martin. <laughs> so, did you make up your mind? Yes, no? Okay. Um, I give you the answer. So, let's look at the number. Uh, so, what you would see is actually, or what you would compare is the class one CP time and the class one SE time, SE stands for special engine, which is SIP. And you see in this specific example, it's almost nine, uh, almost 50% uh, SIP uh, offloading. Um, a type four connectivity would be more in the ballpark of 55%, so a little bit more, but uh, you know, overall you talk about a fairly small number. And seeing the impact of changing it, um, I told them that uh, it's potentially a very small channel CP saving, and it definitely would not justify the project cost of implementing the change. Uh, one thing you need to consider as well, that the overall CPU consumption for type four connectivity can actually be higher. So uh, you could, could get more special engine offload, but the, general CP consumption not necessarily is lower. So clearly my recommendation was not, uh, I don't think it's worthwhile changing from objective to reduce general CP consumption. Okay, then a second um, practice uh, so when I looked at the accounting report, I saw those SQL uh, statistics as well as uh, threat management uh, statistics. Uh, and the question to you, what performance optimization would you recommend for this Java application? And I give you a hint, uh, look at the SQL executed per commit and look at the threat management per commit as well. They were all listed in my presentation. Um, and obviously, no, you know, those people did not listen to my presentation and uh, weren't aware that they can do something about it. So I give you a minute to think. Okay, then let's go to the next slide, which helps you with the answer. So the first thing uh, what you can observe when you look at the SQL statistics is actually a single row select per commit, which is very common in a J2EE um, uh, application. So the single row is to populate an object uh, and then you use auto commit, which is the default in JDBC. So my first recommendation would be turn auto commit off um, and commit at the end of the transaction. Uh, and the second one is when you look at the 
uh, re-sign on statistics, it's actually going through a re-sign on, on every uh, uh, SQL request. So this would be a perfect example to actually bind the JDBC packages with release deallocate uh, to avoid those repeated resign on. Uh, my guess is that the cost of this avoidable threat management and commit processing is a multiple of the cost of executing the simple SQL. So I would expect that uh, by implementing those two changes that uh, the overall CPU consumption can be reduced by, in the ballpark, somewhere 60, 70, 60, 70 percent in CPU. So it's really significant. Mm -hmm. So what I want to show you with this example is blindly going to type 4 with getting more SIP offload may not be the correct answer. There may be also optimizations that give you a dramatically better CPU reduction um, and actually helps also with the scalability of the application. So I hope you, you uh, came up with the same recommendation and the same ideas. Uh, I, I just wanted to share. This is actually a true customer analysis uh, and it's actually not as old. Okay, so my last slide is uh, actually a, a Summarizing configuration objects, uh, option accessing DB2 and DB2 for COS. And, and that is actually a very recent discussion, uh, you know, especially in the context that we introduced uh, DB2 RESTful service support. Um, the question is what of the option exists and how should I um, compare them with each other? On, on different um, criteria. And you see in this table um, that we have uh, different, selected different criteria, like how looks the payload, you know, what is the uh, eligibility for SIP offload, and uh, the development skill is also very important our days. So the configuration that we covered in the presentation was option number two. Um, when you look at the uh, uh, synchronous processing pattern, option number two and the last two options are very common now. Um, going to DB2 data via uh, Kix and Kix transaction gateway is somewhat the old style of doing it. Um, and in this case, at least the last option should be considered, or in some in some cases, it may make sense to look into um, using DB2 RESTful service support and have a REST JSON payload that the application at the end is potentially expecting. So, uh, and of course, uh, the MQ communication is a pattern if you want to have an asynchronous communication model, which uh, there are good use cases to do that. So, um, just a little alternative, I put a store. Uh, you could, instead of WebSphere and JDBC type 4, you could also put in .NET and ODBC CLI driver. It's a equivalent configuration. And everywhere where you have kicks, it could also be IMS TM. Um, it's, it's also very common and it, it works very similar. Okay, so uh, in summary, uh, the message I'd like you to take away from this presentation, enterprise level Java applications have been implemented commonly and successfully for many years. Nevertheless, it is worthwhile to refuse the recommendation checklist when upgrading DB2 or the clients or when deploying new applications. Um, as the uh, recommendation need to be implemented by the WebSphere ad or Web Application Server Administrator, DBA or DB2 Systems Programmer, and the application architect I think good communication amongst them helps a lot. 
and maybe a beer or, or coffee may help <laughs> for this communication. Um, and then keep in mind the expectation that there is uh, application availability and not system availability. So uh, DB2 and the data server drivers support, both support continuous availability, so use it. And then, of course, monitor the effectiveness of caches and react proactively as workload behavior changes over time. And do not wait until users complain, as they may not have looked, they may have looked for alternatives at that point. Okay, so um, Martin, I don't know if we have time for questions. We do, but uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, based on how well you've done, we have no questions on the queue. So I think we're at a point where we could wrap it up and ask our final polling question. And uh, I'll do that in just a minute. As soon as I find that little guy, oh, there he is. Let me let me take back control, and yep. I'll do the final thing. That was good clarification. Uh, you know, it's it's rather funny for me because just as an aside, I uh, taught at a local college here in Toronto for for a, a number of years, and uh, one of the things that the people working in that the the, the computer science group of the um, college we're talking about is Java's, uh, in their mind, was a legacy language. Of course, when- Yeah, I know. Versus Python, for example. Yeah, they like Python. Python is the uh, the way of their future. But of course, I don't even know what they think of COBOL then, if they think JSON is a- You know, this was this was an old language when I, when I went to university, so it's, yeah. it's definitely old. <laughs> It's kind of funny how things work out. But, uh, anyway, I think you should be seeing my screen now, so I'll just um, uh, go in here and, uh, oops, I need to uh, do the last final and most important question, asking folks if they learn anything today. And if, uh, absolutely, the numbers, people are voting quickly, and thank you for that. And uh, we have the answer we like, which is 100% of our audience learn something today, which is fantastic and not unexpected when you're presenting. We, I, mean, I always know you can do a great job. So that's kind of, that's great to see though. We appreciate that and we'll move on uh, into that famous time of the day where uh, us people on the East Coast are thinking of something very important called lunch. So uh, I'll just remind people that DBI Software is the founding sponsor of the DB2 Night Show. and uh, on their behalf, I'll thank you for coming in uh, this time. We'll see you in three weeks when uh, when I'll be presenting uh, on the DB2 LUW uh, show. And with that, have a great weekend. Hopefully the weather is starting to improve where you are. It's been rainy and cold here in Toronto, but at least we don't have to shovel snow in May. So that's a good thing. But uh, have a great weekend. Cue the music and uh, and we'll call it a call it a show. Thanks again, Mariella. Great job. And we look forward to having you again. And we'll look forward to having our audience back soon with us for more shows. Take care yeah, all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Be safe. Bye-bye.